The higher one goes, the harder life becomes. Living on a mountain is always more difficult at the top, where the climate is harshest, than on the kinder, lower slopes. And it's the climate which creates deserts. Though they may look empty, life survives here too, often in conditions every bit as harsh as on the mountain peaks. In North America, the Rocky Mountains rise to over 4,000 meters, while in the nearby deserts, rivers have carved deep canyons well below sea level. Between these great extremes, a wonderful diversity of wildlife is found, from the depths of the valleys to the very tops of the mountains. There is wildlife even on the bleak and desolate peaks of the mountains. This is the alpine zone, with a climate similar to that of the Arctic. At this height, over 4,600 meters above sea level, high wind speeds reduce the temperature to minus 10 degrees centigrade in winter. Up here, animals like Rocky Mountain goats must be extremely well adapted to their harsh surroundings. Their thick, shaggy coats provide insulation from the bitter cold, while their agility and sure-footedness allows them to investigate almost any crevice. In spring, the snows recede from the mountain tops several weeks later than in the valleys below. A long-tailed weasel has its home among the rocky scree. The boulder-strewn slopes are also the home of ptarmigan, which live here all the year round. Ptarmigan change their plumage seasonally to match their surroundings. Even in June, patches of snow linger on the tops of the mountains. The golden eagle is master of the air. It ignores the mobbing of the ravens, and its powerful flight allows it a freedom of movement experienced by few other animals in the mountains. On the mountainside, the plants are distributed in patterns determined by the climate. This zoning is mirrored by some animal species too. They are governed by the availability of food and shelter. The pika is a member of the rabbit family. They have their burrows among the crevices of the alpine scree slopes. Eastward moving air masses from the Pacific Ocean provide the heavy winter snowstorms which fall on the high Rockies. It's the spring meltwater from these snow fields which gives birth to rivers and streams. Trees cannot grow at the highest elevations because of the effects of exposure. On the mountain tops, only low growing plants, more typical of the tundra, are able to survive. But below 3,600 meters is the tree line where the forest begins. Bighorn sheep are extremely hardy creatures. They give birth to their lambs in late spring.
The open slopes and subalpine meadows just above the tree line allow the bighorns a clear view of their surroundings, which gives the ewes with lambs a greater feeling of security. Yellow-bellied marmots live at altitudes of up to 4,000 meters. Also known as rock chucks, the marmots often use large boulders as lookout platforms. Home is usually a burrow beneath the rocks. After their hibernation, the minerals these outcrops contain provide the marmots with vital trace elements. Below the subalpine meadows, dense forests clothe the mountain slopes. Because more rain falls at the higher elevations, the most luxuriant growth is found further up rather than lower down the mountainsides. In the dense conifer forests, rivers and streams provide an additional habitat occurring at all altitudes. The belted kingfisher favors stretches of river with steep-sided banks in which it excavates its nesting tunnels. Surprisingly, tiny hummingbirds are found even at these altitudes. In summer, a profusion of orchids allows them to live and breed high up in the Rockies. The most successful nests are close to meadows where the nectar-rich flowers are most abundant. To provide sufficient food for their chicks, the parent hummingbirds must forage for many hours each day. Another species of bird prefers fast running water. The American Dipper feeds chiefly on insect larvae beneath the surface. Its feathers are so well waterproofed that it emerges completely dry after being immersed in water. In the pine woods, the trees are densely packed together and little sunlight reaches the ground. But among the pine forests are groves of deciduous aspen trees. Because they let in more light, there's thicker vegetation at ground level, which in turn sustains a more abundant wildlife. The trunks of the aspens provide homes for whole nesting birds, like woodpeckers, sapsuckers and tree swallows. Wherever there's food for birds and smaller mammals, predators like the lynx are attracted too. Porcupines feed on bark and also climb trees to reach tender twigs and buds. Although slow moving, the porcupine's sharp quills are usually a strong deterrent to predators.
the lynx has thought better of an encounter. It leaves its hiding place to go in search of easier prey. The boundaries between the different forest zones are not always clear cut, but below 2,000 meters, lower rainfall results in dry forests of juniper and smaller, scrubby pine trees. Mule deer are found here particularly in winter when they're driven from the higher forests by bad weather. The large antlers of a mature buck demonstrate its superior strength and status to other members of the herd. Another environment in the Rocky Mountains is not created by a zone of vegetation but largely by the work of an animal. The beaver can be found in rivers at almost any altitude except the alpine zone. The industrious beavers build dams across rivers and streams, creating still ponds which support a rich aquatic vegetation. Over time, beaver ponds create an ideal environment for many species of aquatic animals. In parts of Wyoming and Montana, trumpeter swans use them to raise their young. Cassin's finches come to feed on the algae which blooms in summer on the still lake water. Despite its name, the river otter is also found in ponds and lakes. Lithe and supple swimmers, which feed mainly on fish, frogs and crustaceans, American otters have in the past been heavily hunted for their pelts. The distribution of reptiles and amphibians is more strongly influenced by climate. Most species can only live below a height of two and a half thousand meters where it's drier and warmer. The garter snake is one of the few species which is able to live any higher. Trumpeter cygnets feed themselves on a mixture of insects and plants. In an average year, the young swans, which are hatched in the Rockies, have less than three months to grow to the flying stage. The spring and summer in the mountains are very short. Beaver lakes also create ideal conditions for large mammals. Moose, the tallest of all deer, are browsers. During the summer months, they feed largely on aquatic plants and willows, which grow around the margins of the mountain lakes. Beavers create a rich environment for many species by removing trees round the lake edge. The margins are then encroached by dense vegetation, which provides both food and cover for many plant eaters, such as the muskrat.
anywhere below a height of 2,000 meters experiences a dramatic change in vegetation. Here, rainfall is normally below 50 centimeters a year, too dry for forests to grow. Sagebrush marks the transition between the forests and the true grasslands. In spring, the sage grouse gather at their courtship grounds. The grasslands are rich in small rodents and plant-eating insects. After wolves were exterminated, the coyote became the most numerous predator of the Rocky Mountain region. It's found in a variety of habitats, but is particularly common on the plains, where it preys on the abundant rodents. One of the best known inhabitants of the plains is the prairie dog. Prairie dogs live in colonies. They dig complex underground burrow systems. Prairie dogs are constantly on the lookout for attack from both ground and aerial predators. A nearby bison poses no threat to the prairie dogs. Bison used to inhabit the plains of North America in their millions. Today, some herds again roam the wide open grasslands, much as they did before overhunting nearly exterminated them. On the plains, the larger grassland herbivores, like bison, have now largely been replaced by cattle. But the prairie dogs can survive, provided the grasses are grazed by larger species, whether wild or domestic. In late summer, the bison bulls begin to fight for the right to mate with the cows. Bison live on the plains throughout the year. But for some of the animals which live higher up the mountains, the onset of autumn requires preparations to be made for the winter ahead. From late summer onwards, pikers begin to collect grasses and other plants. They're stored in piles, usually under a rocky overhang, where deer and sheep are unable to reach. Where other animals would starve, the little piker survives the mountain winter, deep in its rocky fortress of boulders, feeding on its own supply of stored hay. Winter arrives significantly earlier on the mountain tops than it does in the valleys and on the forested slopes.
On the high peaks, animals like the elk have already started to move to lower slopes as the weather worsens. Unlike elk, marmots don't travel long distances to escape bad weather. They live in the subalpine meadows all year round. In autumn, they begin to gather grass too, but unlike the pikers, which store it for food, the marmots only use grass to build their underground nests. Here they'll spend the coming winter months in hibernation beneath a blanket of snow. As the elk herds move down the mountains into the protection of the forests, they come into rut. The stags, which have spent the summer in bachelor groups, go in search of the females. As well as being used to fight rivals, the stag's antlers help to advertise himself, as do the bugling calls. Higher up, where patches of last year's snow still remain, it's mating time for the bighorn sheep. As the rams come into breeding condition, they join the ewes, following and scenting each female in turn. Soon, like the elk, the bighorn sheep will forsake the highest slopes at the approach of the coming winter. In October, the first blizzards blanket the mountain tops with a fresh covering of snow. The animals which live here have now mostly retreated to the shelter of the forests below. Any large mammals which linger on the higher slopes are now at the mercy of the weather. By late November, the mountain peaks will again be isolated by a combination of their high altitude and the plummeting temperatures. Now the ptarmigan have different plumage to match their changed background. Further down in the forests, life is becoming harder too. As winter bites, heavy snowfalls cover even the lowest slopes, making food more difficult to find.
Soon the mountain lakes and rivers will be frozen over, forcing the ducks and swans to move elsewhere in their search for open water. But for the coyote and the other mammals of the high Rockies, the hardest months of the year will be spent here, among the deep snows of winter. For the animals that live in the lower zones of the valleys, freezing temperatures and thick snow are not among the problems they have to live with. Instead, they face intense heat and lack of water. Rain, when it comes, is sporadic and can never be relied on. In some years, a few centimeters may fall at best. In others, there's hardly any. For most of the year, there's little in the way of vegetation, but animals can eke out a living here. Desert bighorns, close relatives of the mountain bighorns that live on the slopes high above, wander among the rocks in search of plants. Unlike their high-altitude cousins, these bighorns rarely clash horns. Conditions here are too severe for such a waste of energy. They are true browsers and only take a nibble from each plant. Donkeys, left to run wild by early settlers, are much more destructive, trampling and destroying vegetation completely and driving away the shy bighorns. They're remarkably resilient and seem to be able to survive in almost any conditions. Wild grazing animals cannot compete with domestic stock for food, and the donkeys have pushed out the bighorns from the valley floors onto the steeper, drier slopes. But the young of both animals could fall prey to a common predator. Although coyotes normally feed on smaller animals, a newborn bighorn would certainly attract their attention. These desert dwellers lack the thick winter fur of the coyotes that live on the high Sierras and only venture out to hunt in the cool mornings and evenings. The rocks beneath them provide a roost for a small group of long-nosed bats. Some have already ventured out this evening. Their pollen-covered heads give the game away. They typically live in small colonies near the entrance to caves or abandoned mines and head out each evening into the desert below in search of fresh cactus flowers. These bats play a vital role in the pollination of the saguaro cactus, itself an important part of the desert ecosystem. They take it in turns to bury their heads deep into the pollen-laden flowers as they fly from plant to plant. The Joshua tree, a type of yucca, is also reliant on animals for the pollination of its flowers.
Amid the large, waxy petals, a yucca moth crawls around in search of pollen. The moth and the plant are completely dependent on each other. Neither can survive alone. The insect does not possess a mouth as an adult, and so does not feed. It does, however, collect pollen under its head. As the moth moves from flower to flower and from plant to plant, it carries its precious load and fertilizes the plant's developing ovaries. But the Joshua tree pays a price for this important service. The moth uses its needle-like ovipositor to lay eggs in part of what will eventually develop into a seed pod. Its larvae will eat some seeds inside their living cocoon, but enough will ripen to ensure the next generation of plants. It's a symbiosis developed over countless generations to the eventual benefit of both parties. It's similar to the bats that are still busily pollinating the saguaros in return for a sip of nectar. Lizards are cold-blooded and rely on the heat of the sun to raise their body temperature. Chuckwallas and desert iguanas emerge from rock crevices to soak up the sun's rays. They're both heavy-bodied vegetarians and it takes some time for the sun to warm up their body core. The fringe-toed lizard is much smaller and heats up more quickly. As the sun rises, the lizard's problem changes from one of trying to heat up to one of finding shade to prevent overheating. It's a problem they share with their reptilian cousin, the desert tortoise. It's only active at the beginning and end of the day and spends the rest of the time within its cool burrow. The males are territorial and will not tolerate a rival for a nearby female. If the tortoises are evenly matched, the fight can last for up to an hour. They're surprisingly aggressive, but rarely draw blood. The main aim seems to be to get the other male onto his back, which occasionally proves fatal in the intense heat. The desert tortoise would certainly not be the first animal to succumb to the harshness of this environment. Water is, and always has been, the key to survival in the desert, whether for plant, animal, or man. Throughout America's Mojave Desert, there are the remains of man's first attempts to tame this harsh environment. Miners and ranchers were the first to try. Cattle can just about survive here, provided they have plenty of water, usually drawn up from deep boreholes. They need a good supply of salts, too. Temperatures here at midday are regularly well over 40 degrees centigrade. Little moves.
Some plants thrive here. The ocotillo will flower at any time of the year if there's enough moisture. The old leaf bases form effective defensive spines and a convenient perch for a cactus wren. Bees and hummingbirds probe the flowers for nectar. Costa's hummingbird has a long, thin beak that can reach well down inside the tubular flowers. The verdin also has a taste for the sugary nectar, but its beak is short and thick. But it's sharp enough to peck a hole at the base of the flowers, directly above the nectar supply. Its tongue can do the rest. The Joshua tree seed pods are developing well. Inside them, the yucca moth larvae are busy eating their way through some of the seeds. Other plants in this desert scrub zone provide a home for a variety of creatures. A choya cactus forms the ideal nest site for a pair of thrashers. The spines are very effective in keeping predators at bay. The roadrunner wouldn't hesitate to eat the young chicks if it could get at them. It's an active predator and hunts any small animals, insects, small rodents, lizards and snakes, even venomous rattlesnakes. It too turns to the safety of the choya cactus when choosing a nest site. Although it's a member of the cuckoo family, it builds its own nest and rears its own chicks. The roadrunner can fly, but rarely does so, preferring instead to run everywhere at great speed. The whiptail is one of the desert's fastest lizards. These chicks won't go hungry. The vino pepla also has a pair of hungry mouths to feed. Her nest is in a more open location and around midday she has to use her wings as a parasol to shade her young chicks. Although a member of the flycatcher family, the phenopepla feeds almost exclusively on the berries of the parasitic mistletoe that grows on the mesquite bushes. The whole berries are regurgitated for the chicks in a seemingly never-ending stream. Each berry contains a seed that passes through the bird's stomach unaltered. As her droppings fall onto the branches, the seeds stick and germinate ensuring the bird's future food supply. Rain, when it sweeps over the Mojave, is brief and violent. On average, only 10 centimeters a year falls on this desert. The rain triggers seeds that may have lain dormant in the soil for years. The new plants and flowers create a tortoise paradise.
This young desert tortoise hatched only a few months ago and must remain well hidden in order to survive. The moisture and energy it gets from this sudden glut may have to see it through the next few months. It may take 15 or 20 years to reach full size, but few of the hatchlings make it. Empty shells at the base of a telegraph pole are a sure sign that the tortoises have fallen prey to a raven. The ravens were once a rarity here in the desert. Life was just too harsh for them and they posed little threat to the tortoise population. But the ever-growing human presence here has seen an explosion in raven numbers. They find rich pickings on the rubbish dumps, allowing them to thrive and multiply here. Their population has risen 15-fold in 20 years. This has spelt disaster for the tortoise hatchlings whose shells litter the raven's abandoned nest. Raven numbers may have to be controlled. After generous rains, the desert bursts into bloom. The desert scrub zone disappears under a sea of poppies. But where there's a sea, the beach is never far away. This is not a zone for the faint-hearted. Only the toughest and most finely adapted plants and animals can survive here. Surprisingly, one of them is the larva of a hawk moth. It feeds by night on desert plants and seeks refuge by burrowing into the sand during the day. Its tracks leave a telltale trail in the sand. The tracks left behind by the sidewinder are unmistakable. It's a type of rattlesnake that's highly adapted to life on the shifting sand dunes. But the ability to dune hop that has taken the snake countless generations to evolve is available to us simply by mounting a dune buggy. The noise deafens lizards and rodents destroying their defenses against predators. The tires squash plants and crush animals in their burrows. The thin crust that holds the surface together is broken down, leaving the sand to blow in the wind and the dunes damaged for decades. of the Mojave cannot survive as racetracks. These are more than exquisite wind-sculptured piles of sand. They support a complex and highly adapted community of plants and animals, which nevertheless is incredibly fragile. Nightfall brings a respite from the motorbikes and buggies, and the desert's nocturnal inhabitants can emerge from their daytime retreats. Burrowing owls are aptly named. They live in burrows, though not of their own making. They rely heavily on the abandoned homes of desert tortoises. The sidewinder remains active well after dark, 
scouring the dunes for nocturnal rodents. Kangaroo rats emerge from their extensive burrow systems under cover of darkness. It's not completely safe after dark, and the rodent relies on its speed and agility to escape predators, such as owls and coyotes, and to avoid other kangaroo rats. These pocket-sized rodents are highly territorial. Any intruder finds itself instantly seen off. The reason is simple. The rats are great hoarders. They need to store food in times of plenty to survive harsh times. If they lose their stash of seeds, they could die. Its burrow is a safer place to hide them and easier to protect. Several thousand years ago, the floor of Mojave's Death Valley was a huge lake. It's long since disappeared. Now there's only dust. Today, a handful of tiny springs still bring up water but it's incredibly salty and bitter to the taste. The salts are formed by evaporation in the dry air. But these saline springs still attract life. A water pipit hunts for brine flies at the water's edge. The salty water trickles into pools on the lowest part of the desert floor. Some of these pools are created by the action of underground springs. As these fossil waters are extracted for use by farms and cities, the levels of the pools drop. The underground reservoirs collapse, never to be restored. Algae, which flourish in these pools, support minute forms of life. And surprisingly, many of these hot saline springs have fish in them too. These desert pupfish are among some of the rarest fish in the world. They have the ability to survive temperatures of 35 degrees centigrade in water six times saltier than the sea. Many are unique to their own particular spring, and some species have already become extinct as their tiny world has trickled away to nothing. The pupfish are just managing to survive in an unthinkably harsh environment 100 meters below sea level. In the Rocky Mountains, which border the desert canyons, life exists as high as 4,000 meters and flourishes at all levels between the two extremes. Such an enormous diversity of wildlife can exist in only a few places on Earth. 